So hello everyone and welcome to the Bristol Poverty Institute's Poverty Dimension of COVID-19 webinar series. My name is Lauren Winch and I'm the manager of the Bristol Poverty Institute based at the University of Bristol. So just a quick bit of housekeeping first before we start our webinar. We have two BSL interpreters with us here today, Claire and Darren, thank you very much for joining us, who will be providing sign language interpretation today. So just to note, when slides are shared, the interpreter's videos will get smaller, um, but there is a grey vertical line in the middle between the interpreters and the slides, which you can drag sideways to adjust the sizing. Um, we will be spotlighting them on screen, so you should be able to see them clearly, but if you do need to use those interpreters and cannot see them at any point or if they're too small, please just put a message in the chat or in the Q&A and my colleague Joe will try and assist you to get that sorted. For everyone who's joining us today, please make sure that you've added your name rather than being listed as guest, um, just so we can ensure all attendees are legitimate and also so we know who is asking questions when we get to the Q&A later on. If you have any questions for the panelists, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Please do use the Q&A box rather than the chat function, just to ensure that we pick up your question and doesn't get lost in the conversation. We'll get through as many of, as we can with the time that we have, and we'll be doing an open panel Q&A after the presentations. So please state which speaker your question is aimed at when you put it in there. If you'd like to ask a question, but have any difficulties with written English, please click either the raised hand button um, or type BSL in the Q&A box. And my colleague Joe will then temporarily enable your video and audio for, to enable you to ask your question yourself um, when I invite you to speak. So for everybody, please just be respectful in your comments and questions. And we do reserve the right to remove anyone from the webinar whose comments we deem offensive or inappropriate. Um, hopefully that won't happen, but we just, we just need to, to mention that. Um, we do also encourage you to please tweet about the event if you're hopefully enjoying it um, and just share, share some of the discussion and the, the facts and, and um, then kind of what we're talking about here today. Our series hashtag is hashtag COVID-19 poverty and our handle is at Bristol Poverty and we can provide you with those details via email if helpful or via the chat window. And finally, just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared online. Um, so just to, to make you aware of that, and um, do feel free to leave the event if, if you're not comfortable with that, but do be mindful if you've asked to, to uh, speak verbally um, and have your video shared, that that will be included in the recording. So um, just, just be aware that that, that will, will be happening. So before moving on to the presentations, I just wanted to provide you with a quick introduction to the Bristol Poverty Institute. We were established in 2017 as one of the seven specialist research institutes at the University of Bristol in recognition of the university's strengths in poverty research and is headed up by its director, Professor David Gordon, who's a world leading researcher in poverty and social justice and is here with us today. The BPI was set up, sorry, using those acronyms, BPI is, is Bristol Poverty Institute, if, if I drop into that again. Um, so we were set up with the ambition of driving forward the university's research on causes, effects and measurements of poverty in order to better inform policy and practice. We are aware that achieving this requires engagement and partnerships beyond academia, and we therefore actively encourage non-academic engagement in this webinar series. The series was established to explore the impacts of COVID-19 on those experiencing or at risk of falling into poverty. Uh, so the webinar series aims to bring together a variety of participants representing different sectors with a range of theoretical, methodological and disciplinary approaches. We recognise that different professional, academic and civic communities will have access to different sources of information, different data sets, different tools for analysis, and may also have different immediate priorities. We are, however, all driven by the ultimate aim of reducing the negative impacts of this global pandemic on all aspects of society, and particularly on those communities and individuals who are already experiencing disadvantages. By bringing together a range of perspectives, we seek to improve our understanding of the poverty dimensions of this pandemic, and by extension, our ability to influence policy and practice in order to mitigate its negative impacts. We also think it's really important to bring in voices with lived experiences of the challenges we're discussing. Webinars in this series will have a range of different regional and or thematic foci, 
exploring the various dimensions of how this pandemic will impact on lives across the globe. Um, if anyone here is interested in co-hosting or presenting in a future webinar, do get in touch. We'll have a slide at the end with all of our contact details or just Google us and you'll find us if you search for Bristol Poverty Institute. Moving on to today's event, we've got two fantastic speakers today, bringing different perspectives to the discussion of how the pandemic has impacted on disabled people, including the disproportionate nature of this impact and how this intersects with dimensions of poverty. Each panelist will have around 20 minutes for their presentation. And as noticed previously, please type any questions in the Q&A function in Zoom, which is on the bottom of your screen, separate to the normal chat window. And as I said, we'll be doing the Q&A collectively after both of the presentations. Um, so do make a note in your question of, of who your question is for. So moving on to, to the good stuff, uh, we are opening today with Professor Pauline Heslop, who's a professor of research in intellectual disabilities and the head of the Nora Fry Center for Disability Studies here at the University of Bristol. Pauline joined Nora Fry in 1999 and since then has completed research projects about a range of issues related to services and supports for people with intellectual disabilities. Most recently, she's been the lead researcher for a number of influential studies, including the confidential inquiry to, into premature deaths of people with learning disabilities, commissioned by the Department of Health from 2010 to 2013, and the Learning Disabilities Mortality Review Programme, which was commissioned by NHS England between 2015 and 2021. Both studies raised issues about the premature deaths of people with intellectual disabilities and have led to improvements in policy and practice to help put people in this population to live longer, healthier lives. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Pauline. Thanks very much, Lauren. I'm just going to get my slides up. Pauline, just before you start, can we uh, make sure that we've got the interpreters? Lovely. Thank you, Pauline. Okay. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's um, a pleasure to be here. Um, in this session, um, I'm going to briefly remind you about who we include in the term intellectual disabilities. We'll then move on to the central argument of this presentation, which is that COVID-19 has widened existing inequalities experienced by people with intellectual disabilities. And I'll draw on evidence from three key areas of deprivation. And then finally, I'll conclude with some potential policy responses. So just to be clear about the population group that we're talking about, the definition of intellectual disabilities used here is drawn from the Valuing People White paper, which was published by the Department of Health. And it says that intellectual disability includes the presence of a significantly reduced ability to understand new or complex information or to learn new skills. So by that, they mean an impaired intelligence and a reduced ability to cope independently. And by that, they mean impaired social functioning, both of which would have started before adulthood and would have a lasting effect on the person's development. I want to add a note here about um, the social model of disability, because I think it's important. The social model of disability stresses the influence and impact of social barriers on a person's impairment. Now, here we're talking about people with impairments of intelligence, however you define that, and social, fun social functioning who are disabled by society. Now, the terminology used internationally and nationally is of intellectual disabilities or learning disabilities, as is the case in the UK. And we could argue that it should be changed to learning or intellectual impairment on the assumption that not everyone with an impairment would be disabled by barriers in society. However, we know that most people with intellectual disabilities are disabled by barriers in society to some extent or another. So I'm going to carry on with the conventional terminology of learning or intellectual disabilities. And I do use the terms interchangeably, I'm sorry. Um, we tend to use intellectual disabilities in an international context and learning disabilities in the UK context. But I do want to stress that my starting position is the social model of disability and that it is created by society 
and not intrinsic to the person themselves. I hope that makes that clear. So um, people with intellectual disabilities went into the pandemic already at a significant disadvantage to their peers. And this slide shows the seven domains of deprivation, which combine to create the index of multiple deprivation. On each of the domains, people with intellectual disabilities were at a disadvantage compared to their peers prior to the pandemic. And I won't spend too long on this, as it's not the real focus of the presentation, but I think it's worth reminding ourselves of it. So in relation to employment, people with intellectual disabilities are often involuntarily excluded from the labour market, often because of the availability of roles perceived to be suitable for them and productivity and efficiency concerns. In education, we know that people with intellectual disability often have low levels of attainment and skills achieved through schooling, including the skills needed to be adaptable within a labour market. Regarding health, our own research over the past decade has demonstrated um, the significant risk of premature um, death in people with intellectual disabilities. Regarding crime, people with intellectual disabilities often experience multiple um, discrimination with both an increased risk of personal and material victimization, but also a risk of being perpetrators of crime, sometimes unintentionally when they're taken advantage of by others or they have a lack of understanding of a particular situation. In terms of housing and local services, we know that there are challenges with physical and financial accessibility of housing and other services and resources. We know in terms of the living environment that there's a significantly variable quality of indoor and outdoor environments available um, and experienced by people with intellectual disabilities. And finally, regarding income, um, we know that there is deprivation relating to low income or no control of income. And that's been recognized um, certainly over the last sort of couple of decades for people with intellectual disability. Back in 2007, Eric Emerson's studies documented that 42% of British families supporting a child with intellectual disability were likely to be living in poverty. And a large number of those families suffered material hardships. A few years later, data from the Child and Family Study in the UK indicated that families supporting a child with intellectual disabilities were more likely to be poor, more likely to become poor, and less likely to be able to escape poverty than other families. So the central argument of this presentation is that the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated these pre-existing experiences of deprivation for people with intellectual disabilities. And on those domains of deprivation about which we have information, people with intellectual disabilities appear to have fared less well than others during the pandemic. And that's led to an increase in impoverished lives, premature deaths, and contraventions of human rights. Now I'll evidence this with three examples of aspects of deprivation in people with intellectual disabilities that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, let's look at health. Now, an example of the systemic discrimination faced by people with intellectual disabilities came with the recommendation for the use of the frailty scale in the NICE guidelines for who should be prioritised for access to hospital critical or intensive care during the pandemic. Now, this guideline disadvantaged people with intellectual disabilities from accessing critical or intensive care as it considered how much support people need to live day by day. Those who needed the most support were ranked as less of a priority for hospital intensive or, or critical care. Now, after some outcry, the guideline was changed the following month to clarify that the scale ought not be used with people with intellectual disabilities. 
However, I was involved with um, looking at completed reviews of deaths of people with intellectual disabilities through this period. And we did ident identify cases where the original guidance had been applied and the family and paid carers of the person who had died felt that the person had not been given a fair chance of treatment. So the second example relating to health is in terms of protecting people from COVID. And there are four aspects here. First, the age thresholds for shielding people um, were initially set at age 70, and that disproportionately disadvantaged people with intellectual disabilities. Now, the median age at death for people with intellectual disabilities is 60, 61 years. To be quite frank, most people with intellectual disabilities don't live to the age of 70 to be able to be included in the shielding category. Yet they were known to be very vulnerable to the disease, often through pre-existing health conditions or the social circumstances in which they lived. Secondly, another example of how poorly protected some people with intellectual disabilities were, was that almost a quarter of people with intellectual disabilities who died from COVID-19 um, before the, and this is before the end of 2020, were thought to have contracted the, the virus during a previous hospital visit for an unrelated condition. So people were discharged home from hospital without being tested and then subsequently spread it to others. Third, we know that social distancing was impossible for some people who relied on close contact with paid carers or often a succession of different carers. For example, if a person needed support with their feeding or with toileting, um, social distancing just wasn't possible. And there was very limited guidance about how to handle that situation and limited availability of pro protective clothing for carers. And then fourthly, um, initially people with intellectual disabilities were not prioritized, sorry, prioritized um, for the COVID uh, vaccine. And that was despite data showing that they were more likely to, to die from COVID than the general population. Now there was a government U-turn in February 2020 sorry, 2021, meaning that people could get priority access, but this was very late in the day. And there's also subsequently been concerns that about people with learning disabilities accessing booster jabs. So that's the second aspect of health. The third aspect of health I want to share with you is in relation to access to healthcare for people with intellectual disabilities. And again, there are four aspects here. First, NHS 111 was unable to tailor services for people with intellectual disabilities. And the protocols they used failed to take account of the level of concern raised by carers. So we reviewed deaths of people with intellectual disabilities where repeated calls to NHS 111 had failed to pick up the seriousness of the situation for some people. People with intellectual disabilities themselves said that um, phoning um, the service, were, when phoning the service, they weren't really treated very well and they had difficulty in communicating uh, what they wanted to say. And carers also felt that they weren't listened to. Secondly, we know that tools and equipment used to detect deterioration in primary and um, community settings was not often used for people with intellectual disabilities. And identifying rapid deterioration was critical in treating COVID-19. Now, the most frequently used tool is called NEWS2. It's the National Early Warning Scale. Um, and this relies on people being able to have their blood pressure taken, or have a clip put on their finger to measure their oxygen saturation. And when reviewing deaths, we found that many people were presumed to be unable to tolerate this, and, but no other measures were put in place to detect um, the deterioration in their condition. Thirdly, we know that in many hospitals, specialist nurses for people with intellectual disabilities were often moved or deployed to other clinical areas, 
or had to work from home. Now, this coupled with local policies restricting visitors to hospital meant that many people with intellectual disabilities admitted to hospital were unsupported by anyone who knew them or had the particular skills to be able to support them when they were admitted. And then fourth, for most of these people, the legal requirement for reasonable adjustments to be made was not upheld. So for example, blanket policies were in place without the consideration of the reasonable adjustments to be made to those for people with intellectual disabilities. So I just want to um, finish our little section about health by looking at mortality rates for people with intellectual disabilities during the pandemic. And this data is taken from the National Learning Disabilities Mortality Review Programme. It shows three big bars. The first relates to the general population. The second is adjusted rate for people with learning disabilities. I'll explain that in just a minute. And the third is that unadjusted rate. And within each of the three bars, in grey, um, there is data for the general population. Then there's population, then there's data in orange for males and in blue for females. I'll just talk you through this. So the adjusted rate takes into account that not all deaths are reported to the Learning Disabilities Mortality Review Programme. We probably captured about uh, two thirds to three quarters of them. So the unadjusted rate is the data as we had them. The adjusted rate is taking into account those uh, under-reporting under of deaths to the programme. And the slide indicates a very high um, age standardised uh, COVID-19 death rate for people with learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities. Um, it shows that males, females, and all, all people with intellectual disabilities were more likely to die from COVID-19 um, than people in the general population. Now, the high age standardised rates in people with intellectual disabilities were also evidenced um, in Office for National Statistics data. So to the end of December 2020, the rates for people with intellectual disabilities were 3.7 times greater for both men and women than um, compared to people without intellectual disability. Now, after using statistical models to adjust for a range of factors, including comorbidity, a raised risk of 1.7 times remained unexplained for both men and women with um, intellectual disabilities. So let's look on, to, uh, move on to our second example of um, deprivation. And here I want to just touch on access to local services. Now, much of the data in, in these the following slides comes from the National Coronavirus and People with Learning Disabilities Study of which I was a, a co-investigator. And two cohorts of participants took part in this study. It's important for you to understand which, who's, who, who's in which cohort. So cohort one was of people with intellectual disabilities themselves. Cohort two was family or paid carers of people who were unable to take part in the survey themselves. So it was predominantly carers of people with more severe or profound intellectual disabilities. Now, although that data set is the largest to date, examining the experiences of adults with intellectual disabilities during the COVID pandemic, it does have some limitations. And I think we need to be frank about those. So data were collected um, over a three month period in the UK, but there were some variations in restrictions across the different parts of the UK. So for example, there was different legislation in Scotland and Northern Ireland than there was from in, in England and Wales. So we need to bear that in mind. 
There are also some differences in the way that questions were presented to each of the cohorts. So those in cohort one, so people with learning disabilities themselves, were interviewed face to face, whereas those in cohort two, so that's um, paid or family carers, were asked to respond um, to an online survey. And then finally, some of the recordings of cohort one participants weren't always verbatim responses. They were um, responses that were remembered by the interviewer. Nevertheless, the study found that there'd been a reduction in overall support or no access to support for many people with intellectual disabilities compared to before the pandemic. So 42% of people in cohort one um, had reduced or no access to their usual support compared to before the pandemic. And that was the case for 55% of people in cohort two. There was, however, the provision and um, an increased provision of online support um, compared to prior to the pandemic. So 45% of people in cohort one accessed more online support than they did prior to the pandemic, as did um, almost a quarter, 23% of those in cohort two. So let's hear the voices of um, some of the carers of those affected by changes to the support for the people that they cared for. I'll read these out for you. One person said, as a family, we have worked round the clock to minimize a negative impact on our son, but we are absolutely exhausted now. A second person said, she is frustrated at a lack of meaningful activity and is not allowed to go to a day service she used to enjoy, even though it's been open since April. A third person, said support staff have to prioritise clients needing 24-7 care. And by 24-7 care, we mean that somebody needs support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. With many staff sick or self-isolating, shift cover has been stretched very thin and shifts cancelled. Another person said, the impact of not being out of the care home in nearly 18 months has resulted in mobility being reduced, deteriorating mental health, a reduced quality of life. And finally, one paid carer wrote on um, the, the response to the survey, bored, frustrated, exhibited some violent behavior, forced to spend too much time with housemates he didn't choose, after some months became lethargic, resigned to a reduced life. So the third example of an area of deprivation I want to go through with you is in relation to income. Now again, most of the supporting evidence for this comes from the National Coronavirus and People with Learning Disabilities Study. And the first thing we can look at is the provision of funding in lieu of um, direct provision of services. So it's, it's really the provision of direct payments or personal budgets. And the study indicated that for most people, the amount of funding in a personal budget had stayed the same um, since the start of the pandemic, which was good. However, a third of people were paying for services that they no longer received. And a quarter felt that services or supports had become more expensive during the pandemic. The second aspect of income deprivation we have, for, we have data for is um, family expenditure on support services. And a sizable proportion of people with intellectual disabilities or their family members were paying for services from their own money. Um, and that was the case for 36% um, of people with um, in cohort one and 42% in cohort two. And rather worrying 13% had cut back on their services and supports during the pandemic because they said they couldn't afford them. <laughs> 
A third aspect to look at is personal income. Now, although the issue is touched on by some studies, um, the economic status of people with intellectual disabilities, including income mobility, poverty, and income patterns, have not yet been thoroughly examined, to my knowledge, anyway. Um, examining employment rates is quite challenging. It's not sufficient to deepen our understanding of the full extent of poverty among people with intellectual disabilities, largely because the amounts earned are generally too insignificant to have an effect on their overall economic status. But we do know that the part-time, low-paid jobs that people with intellectual disabilities are likely to work in were the hardest hit during the pandemic as those were the types of positions that were less likely to be able to accommodate people to work from home. And while the crisis didn't appear to affect wages, there would be large impacts on the hours worked by these employees, significantly, significantly affecting their overall income. So um, in conclusion, the UK isn't alone in seeing an increase in the inequalities experienced by people with intellectual disabilities during the COVID pandemic. Reports from the United States of America, for example, also suggest that the pandemic has increased deprivation and negatively hindered quality of life outcomes for people with intellectual disabilities in a number of areas. Now, govern governments make political and policy choices about how they protect their populations from the impact of um, the pandemic. And hindsight is a wonderful thing, um, but at least in relation to people with intellectual disabilities, in, uh, in my view, and borne out by the limited evidence that we do have, um, the government acted in ways that reinforced existing inequalities during the pandemic. Now, policy and practice does now need to consider and act upon the disproportion um, effects of the pandemic on people with intellectual disabilities and other population groups so affected. And we must ensure that inequalities are lessened and not further increased. And I think there's a moral um, need for redress here. So finally, what could some leveling, leveling out policies look like? We need to recognise the role of prejudice, social oppression and discrimination, both that's happened during the COVID pandemic and prior to that and currently. And, and as I say, there is a need for redress for this. Secondly, we need to reduce the disability employment gap. Um, suggested ways of doing this are by providing support and advice for employers sharing risk, and I'm putting risk in inverted commas here, and it really means perceived risk, with the government paying sick pay or covering absences and incentivising employment, upholding the regulations of the Equalities Act 2010, ensuring the benefit system works in line with employment practices. It's been long known that um, the two systems work in opposition to each other in many respects, and upholding employee rights. We need to prioritise waiting lists in the um, NHS according to the impact of the condition or the impact of waiting for treatment on an individual and their quality of life. We need to reassess the support needs to take into account the, the impact of the pandemic. And that's the case across a wide range of people who've been disadvantaged by the pandemic. And Fifth, we need to address the social and structural um, exclusions to the seven domains of deprivation. So that's employment, education, health, crime, housing and local services, the living environment and income. And I just want to finish with a, a favourite quote from Nelson Mandela. And he said, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their very humanity. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pauline. That was really thought provoking and, and some really important um, proposals at the end there for tackling some of these issues. So 
hopefully that will generate a really, really good discussion and people will be able to take those, those ideas forward um, away from this webinar today. So our second presentation is from Fazile Hadi, who is the Head of Policy at Disability Rights UK. Fazile started her career as a solicitor in law centres, held senior equality roles in local government, and was a director at the Royal National Institute of Blind People, where she developed a membership scheme, expanded advice services, and led many successful campaigns to improve laws and policies for blind and for partially sighted people. Fazile started working for Disability Rights UK in January 2020, and has sought to challenge the unequal treatment of disabled people during the coronavirus crisis. Fazile is also a member of the Disability Advisory Committee of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and she's a non-executive director of Cambridgeshire Community Services NHS Trust. So I'll hand over to you now, Fazile. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Lauren. And um, I should start by saying I'm not a member of the um, Equality and Human Rights Committee Advisory Committee on Disability anymore because that ceased in March. I think that's just a function of the conference was going to be held. This conference was going to be held a bit earlier, so I apologise. So good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to be with you. And I learned so much from Pauline. Um, and I'm going to echo um, quite a bit of what Pauline said. Um, I'm, as Lauren said, I'm Fazile Hardy and I'm Head of Policy at Disability Rights UK. I'm visually impaired myself and have lived with visual impairment since I began to lose my sight when I was around nine. So um, I feel I've got more lived experience than I actually want of living with visual impairments. Um, but hopefully it's given me a real um, sense of, of how the social model does work that, Lauren, um, that Pauline was referring to. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, Disability Rights UK, for those of you that don't know us, um, we're a, a national um, charity um, whose mission is to create a more equal society and a more inclusive society for disabled people. Um, We've advocate, we advocate for rights, um, equality of opportunity, equality of access to power and inclusion across all aspects of life. And as Pauline was mentioning, we, we are, are subscribers very much to the social model of disability, um, which really puts a focus on not our impairments or our conditions, um, although of course there is a place for that, but puts a focus on how society can include us by um, changing its attitudes to us, by developing policies and services that are inclusive, by creating environments, um, streets, housing, etc., that are inclusive, and by making sure that information uh, meets our individual needs. There are 14 million disabled people in the UK, we're a fifth of the population, and um, we should be treated as uh, equal citizens. Um, I don't think with this audience I probably have to say more, um, but without taking down those barriers, we are not equal citizens. Today I just, I want to cover three um, areas um, that uh, are affecting and continuing to affect the lives of disabled people. I want to look at public services. Um, I then want to talk about the Equality Act and our rights. And finally, I want to talk about the cost of living crisis. Um, I'll end with some thoughts about opportunities um, to change the world, because I think everyone again at this um, webinar not only wants to describe the world we live in, but to ensure that that world becomes a world that disabled people um, are included in. So let me start with talking a bit about public services. So since at least 2010, we've seen an erosion of public services. And I think disabled people have felt that keenly. Um, we've seen less money go into local authorities and in particular social care. 
uh, we saw the NHS having less funding. Um, and we know that um, special funding for special educational needs is wildly out of step with the needs that children have. And this was all pre-pandemic. We had a, a, a public services that really weren't ready for the challenge of something else being put into the mix. They were already under severe strain. Disabled people were already not receiving the social care they needed, were already not having the educational support that they needed. When the pandemic started back in March 2020, I think the most shocking thing, um, there's so many shocking things. I look back to that first three months of the pandemic and um, so, so many things hit us as disabled people and made us feel that we weren't valued in the same way. The first thing I'd refer to is the introduction of the Coronavirus Act at the end of March 2020, which amongst a lot of other measures to do with, you know, safety and public order and policing, um, had a whole section on the reduction of rights for disabled people. It had, it basically said that um, during the crisis, social care rights could be reduced, um, that rights to education for disabled children could be reduced, and that mental health protections could be reduced. The mental health protections weren't ever reduced, but we did see local authorities um, uh, reduce social care rights. So that act, I mean, it set a real tone. You know, here one, on, on one level, we were a group apparently um, that needed a ring of protection around us, but within sort of weeks, of the crisis starting, we were a group that were having rights taken away from us. As Pauline said, um, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, pretty much at the same time as the Coronavirus Act, um, came out with its guidance um, in terms of accessing critical care, saying that if you needed more support, you were immediately deprioritized for, assist, for critical care and intensive care treatment. And there was uproar, as Pauline said, and, and NICE did clarify that this didn't affect people with long-term um, disabilities, but in a sense, the damage was done and um, it felt like that set the tone. That was followed very quickly by um, stories in the press around GP surgeries sending out blanket do not attempt resuscitation notices for people in residential homes to sign. Um, again, um, CQC and others, um, Care Quality Commission and others, um, actually came out and said that was falling practice quite quickly. But the fact it could have happened at all was very shocking. And the CQC has run an inquiry since into do not attempt resuscitation notices. And um, they found that there were hundreds of them. And that's just the ones they found out about. So I suspect that was the tip of the iceberg. So I'm painting a bit of a picture here about, you know, does society value our lives equally? And I think the vaccination example that Pauline gave falls into that bracket as well, because, um, at the same time that um, people were struggling for people with learning disabilities to rightly move higher up the priority list, we also had to make the case for um, the clinically extremely vulnerable group to move up the priority list, which with hindsight seems um, ridiculous, but that case had to be made. So if we're looking at health, we, we, we saw a lot of, um, I suppose a lot of attacks on our equal rights to health care. Um, we did have maybe the second week of April 2020, um, Disability Rights UK and others within the disability movement put, to get, put together uh, a kind of statement uh, about our rights as disabled people being equal. And the NHS did follow up within three or four days 
with the note to all trusts. Um, it's really reinforcing that disabled people under the NHS constitution had equal rights to treatment. But again, should that really have needed to be said? Um, in terms of social care, if I move away from health to social care, the government were very, very slow in um, planning for social care. And we didn't see a social care action plan till well into um, early May. So five or six weeks after the pandemic had started. And that meant, and Pauline's already alluded to this, that um, people providing care in the community, um, either in people's homes or in residential homes or supported living, found themselves without PPE, um, without testing. Um, people who were using um, direct payments to pay for their own care found themselves really without not knowing where to turn and the guidance for those people came out even later. This was the same time we were having people um, with COVID discharged into care homes. Um, and um, the government has um, had a legal case against it um, for that action, um, which um, was won by the people who brought it. So, you know, we, we had some um, really poor um, treatment of people receiving social care and a government who really, in terms of health and social care, coined the term vulnerable, um, yet, and, and we would argue with that term because disabled people aren't vulnerable, but our, the situations sometimes we're put in makes us very vulnerable. And the government had, had the resources and it had the ability to make sure we weren't put in vulnerable situations, yet they, yet they didn't act on that. Um, in terms of um, social care, as I mentioned, the Coronavirus Act did give authorities the ability to step down services and to relax some of the Care Act provisions around providing assessments um, uh, and delivering social care. And there were eight authorities um, that actually did implement um, the Coronavirus Act. Um, and they would say that um, they were just reprioritizing within the resources they had. Um, but actually it, it just set a very bad precedent to think you could have your rights removed in the middle of a pandemic. Um, actually, when we looked at the experience of disabled people receiving social care during that first year of the pandemic, uh, it didn't really matter whether the local authority had implemented the coronavirus act or not it seemed that um, people did get less support um, arguments were made about well you can't leave the house anyway so you don't need as many hours and people found themselves um, definitely without the um, day centers they were going to but also with less support in the home and less support to get out and about in terms of education, um, the Secretary of State for Education between um, May and July 2020 um, actually um, implemented the Coronavirus Act provisions that really suspended um, the rights to implement your education, health and care plan. Um, and again, it just feels at, at that time when actually young children who had special educational needs and disability needed more support, they got less support. And as Pauline said, families found themselves stranded with no education, no therapies, um, no respite, just stranded. Education went online, which obviously um, didn't work for all disabled children. And um, Really, I think um, families were just left to struggle on their own. So have things improved now? You know, because you could say, well, this all happened two years ago. Well, I don't think they have. Um, social care certainly is in, I mean, it's 
really uh, too hackneyed a word, isn't it, to say it's in crisis because it's just perpetually in crisis. But the Association of Directors of Adult Social Care are talking about half a million people on waiting lists, either for new assessments or for continuing assessments. It's just like uh, incredible to think about the lack of um, social care that's out there at the moment. There's huge, there's at least 100,000 vacancies. People can't recruit carers. Um, it's, it's a very, very um, uh, bad situation, which the government's social care white paper hasn't really affected at all. And the government speaks about giving more funding to social care through the, the levy on national insurance, but actually most of that levy is about funding residential home places when people have um, reached the, the amount that they need to pay. So when they've paid 86,000, you then the state will then step in. So the money that's put aside isn't actually for delivering better or more social care, it's, it's about subsidizing residential care um, and other forms of care. But, but I think the point, the main point is that money is not money that's flowing into the social care system to improve services. So social care hasn't improved. Pauline's mentioned um, about the waiting lists for health. And, you know, many, many disabled people are on those waiting lists. And um, we're not con completely confident that um, those waiting lists are triaged in such a way that where you have an impairment or health condition, that's going to compound the challenges you face by not getting that treatment, that you're going to be moved higher up that list. And on education, we've seen no special steps being taken to help um, children who have um, special educational needs or disability to catch up. Um, a lot's been talked about general catch up provisions, but very little has been said on the additional provisions that are needed for this particular group of children. So I think public services continue to be under huge pressure. And um, although the COVID pandemic put a spotlight on that, I think that we are living with that today and disabled people are facing that under provision every day. If I move to talk about rights under the Equality Act, which is the second area I wanted to cover. The, the Equality Act was passed in 2010, but really, let's be honest, the Disability Discrimination Act was passed in 1995. So, We've had disability discrimination legislation in this country for 25 plus years. But the um, extent to which it's actually implemented by some of our um, public services and our um, private services is, is minimal. And that was really highlighted in the pandemic. Again, we knew this before. We knew that the Equality Act was hard to enforce. It relies on disabled people bringing cases either in employment tribunals or the county court or the high court. You know, this isn't, this isn't an easy thing to do for disabled people. Um, even though government um, organizations have a equality duty placed upon them, um, I think many of us feel that um, that's very hard to um, pin them down on in terms of what real evidence is there that they are implementing their statutory equality duty. So it's left more often than not for disabled individuals to bring cases. And that was before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, um, I just want to uh, highlight some areas of inequality um, that really shouldn't have happened, but did. Um, the first is around um, shopping. So the big supermarkets were told to prioritize people who were clinically extremely vulnerable um, for online shopping. And in doing that, um, they deprioritized many, many disabled people who used online shopping as the reasonable adjustment. And we found thousands of disabled people and older people not 
being able to access online deliveries and not being able to get support and assistance in store. And that just shouldn't have happened. You know, these are some, these businesses made millions during COVID, but they, they, really didn't put reasonable adjustments in place for their disabled customers. In autumn of 2020, the Equality and Human Rights Commission did produce guidance to reinforce um, retailers' obligations under the Equality Act. But really, again, you know, the Disability Discrimination Act was passed in 1995. We saw government regulations come out uh, without any um, reasonable adjustments, um, the hospital visiting regulations that um, Pauline mentioned, actually they were challenged in the courts um, and changes were eventually made to policy and practice because some disabled people do need someone with them when they're in hospital. Um, similarly, they brought out regulations on exercise and how many times a day you could exercise. Again, legal action was brought um, because some people need exercise more than once a day uh, because of their impairment or condition. You know, that those things needn't have happened if disabled people had been at the table when these the thinking about these regulations were, was taking place. In terms of the face covering regulations, we actually do see an example here of where reasonable adjustments were in the regulations, very clearly set out exemptions for face covering. Um, if you needed not to um, use them because you, you, you would experience mental distress or you had a breathing difficulty or you needed to um, a lip read, there were a whole lot of reasonable adjustment exemptions in those regulations. The problem there was they weren't communicated to the wider public. Civic leaders who spoke talked about the, the regulations being mandatory for everyone, and that led to levels of hostility towards disabled people not able to wear face coverings on public transport and in other public spaces. Um, the other thing we saw was um, the um, sprouting up of um, alfresco dining on our pavements. Um, again, um, with very minimal con consultation, um, these street, street furniture tables and chairs were across the pavements, um, not always allowing space for people with visual impairments, mobility impairments to pass by. Um, we, we also, in terms of information, we've seen two high profile cases against the government, one for not um, incorporating BSL into their coronavirus broadcasts and they lost that case they should have done it well obviously they should have done it and one against the government for not providing um, letters to clinically extremely vulnerable people in the format of their choice again the government um, lost that but again you know do we really need did we really need to take a case about that so um, Equality um, is not embedded in our society. If we needed evidence of that, we've had it in spades during the pandemic. And there continue to be issues with, um, with uh, more and more um, application forms becoming digital only, um, with cars being banned from city centres, um, including cars with blue badges. So really barring citizens from being in their own town centres and with um, ele electric charging points for vehicles um, going up on pavements um, uh, in ways that affect pedestrians and also not being accessible to disabled drivers. So we continue to see huge breaches of the Equality Act. And then finally, I just want to touch on the cost of living crisis, because in the, in the midst of public services being cut, our, our, our rights not being respected and implemented, we now have a cost of living crisis. Joseph Roundtree estimates that there's 14 million people living in poverty. Seven million of those people are either disabled or have a disabled person in their household. 
So you can see that disabled people are some of the poorest people in this country. We also have a disability employment gap of nearly 30%. So around 50% of disabled people of working age are in work, whereas around 82% of non-disabled people are in work. So a huge employment gap and a disability pay gap where the pay of disabled people is around almost 20% lower. So again, these, these are all statistics we've lived with for many years. But now we have inflation uh, running at 9.4% and food inflation running at 10%, yet benefits were only increased by 3.1% in April. And during the pandemic, the £20 a week uplift given to people on universal credit was not given to the almost 2 million disabled people on legacy benefits, including employment and support allowance. And even though the government's measures um, on the cost of living crisis are welcome, so the £400 towards our energy bills and the £650 for people on universal credit and other benefits, this time they have included other benefits, and um, the £150 for people on disability benefits, this will not be enough. This will not be enough for disabled people who are some of the poorest because um, some of the energy costs disabled people are going to have to pay um, aren't a matter of just heating homes and of course some disabled people will need to heat homes because um, they won't, won't be so easily be able to keep warm in other ways but there will be many many disabled people who use health related equipment, whether that's ventilators or hoists. There'll be other disabled people who need to charge wheelchairs and other mobility aids. So there's a lot of um, energy that we cannot just switch off as disabled people. It's not a question of living in a cold home. Um, food um, costs, as I've said, are very, very high and going up all the time. And we have figures from the Food Foundation showing that and the most severely disabled people are five or six times more likely to live in food insecurity. And figures from the Trussell Trust showing that um, over 50% of their users are disabled people. The Trussell Trust runs food banks. So we know food insecurity is very high amongst disabled people. And then finally, we know that charges for social care because disabled people often have to contribute towards their social care um, have increased over the last two years and those charges are taken from people's benefits leaving disabled people very very little to live on so um, it's a very bleak picture and I I don't apologize. It, it is a bleak picture. And I, and I absolutely recognize that, you know, some disabled people are doing quite well. They're in jobs, um, that they're, they're leading good lives. And I'm not trying to paint disabled people as victims in any way, but because of the systemic inequalities, because of underfunding of services, because of failure to implement equality legislation, um, and because of disproportionate impact of the cost of living crisis, millions of disabled people are finding themselves in a very, very hard place. So just a few thoughts on opportunities for us to continue the struggle to create a better world for disabled people. I mean, firstly, you've got to say, and you've got to acknowledge that disabled people have spoken up and spoken out individually and collectively. And they've done that for many years. And if it wasn't for disabled people speaking up, we wouldn't have the Disability Discrimination Act. We wouldn't have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We wouldn't have had the successful legal cases we've had in the successful campaigning. And even though government isn't listening to us at the moment, we must carry on speaking truth to power um, until, that, until things change. I think the second thing that is helpful is that um, there are more disabled people um, 
interestingly, um, the Minister for Disabled People is quoting that there's 1.3 more disabled people in work. And she's claiming that as a, a victory for the government strategies. Actually, um, I think it's just a consequence of more disabled people already in the workforce identifying as disabled. And possibly as our workforce ages, we will naturally have more disabled people in the workforce. But the disability employment gap that I spoke about earlier is not shrinking. Um, I think the third thing um, that is, and just to add to that, I think there's groups of people with health conditions like chronic illness, like dementia, that are now thinking about how they frame themselves through the lens of disability and rights, not just through the lens of illness. Because actually, if you're going to live with a, a health condition that can't be cured or treated, really, you really need to take advantage of, of your rights under the Equality Act. And you need to think about the adjustments you need to lead a good life. So I think I think more groups are opening up to re reframing themselves, not just as groups with health conditions, but as groups that are disabled and experiencing disabling barriers. The third positive, I think, is that we find many allies now speaking out because the evidence is so damning and shocking about the impact on disabled people's lives of what's been happening over the last few years. So the Trussell Trust, the Food Foundation, Joseph Roundtree, um, the Resolution Foundation that speaks on um, economic issues. And we're finding more and more reports coming out about the impact on disabled people. And we need those allies, we need that evidence um, to help us paint a picture for people. A few things coming up in the next um, uh, couple of years. Um, so we've got the United Nations actually reviewing the UK government. Um, it's either next year or soon after about its implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And we must use that opportunity to again shine another light on the experiences of disabled people. We've got a general election coming up in a couple of years. And again, we need to be working with the political parties to dramatically raise their game on making society more inclusive. And finally, we do have to take the opportunity to get around the table in terms of climate change, because otherwise we're going to find environmental solutions that will exclude us even more. So we will take those opportunities as fighters for change and disabled people have a, la a long and proud tradition of fighting for change. And we will continue that, however bleak the situation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fazile. Um, as, uh, as you kind of acknowledged, it was a tough listen at times, but it's really important to make people aware of the extent of challenges and the barriers that need to be broken down. And so we do need to have those tough conversations and, and hear those stats and, and understand the different and different challenges that people are facing and the different ways that's impacting on, on their lives. Um, and it was it was really great to end on on the positive note and reflecting on um, some some of those opportunities we have to change the world and thinking about the ways in which um, we might be able to move in in more positive directions going forward. So so thank you very much. It was it was really really great. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances, unfortunately, our final presenter Laura Welty, who is the forum director and chief officer of the Bristol Disability Equality Forum is unable to join us today, um, which has actually meant our first two presentations have been a li little bit longer, which um, obviously has, you know, shown that Laura's not with us, that's really unfortunate, but it's been really nice to be able to hear a bit more from, um, from Pauline and Fazile. Um, and, but we did want to just take this opportunity to highlight the Bristol Disability Equality Forum to our attendees to make you aware of them um, and encourage you to check out their work and, and get in touch with them if, if there's opportunities for you to to maybe work together or have, have good discussions. Um, so we're gonna move on now to our uh, Q&A for our speakers. So we've already got um, a couple in the queue, um, but please do type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'll get through as many as I can in the time that we've got and try and get a balance of questions for our panel members and covering a range of topics. 
Um, if we don't get to your question, do feel free to get in touch with my team and we'd be happy to pass them on to the speakers for you. Um, and we'll have a slide at the end with our contact details. And just a reminder again, I see that Joe's put it in the chat as well, that um, if for you typing a, a question into the Q&A boxes isn't practical cool for any reason, if you, if you have issues with written English, um, do click the raise your hand button or just type BSL in the Q&A box and we'll get your um, your access uh, edited so that you're able to, to ask your question um, through, the, through the video. So um, without any further ado from me, I'll move on to the questions. Oh, um, Lauren, you've got on mute. Oh, really? It's not muted on mine. Can you hear me now? Lauren, your sound's gone. I can hear you. Okay, I'll uh, take over until Lauren comes back. Uh, um, Dave, the, one of the questions we have in the box, Um, okay, so I think there was actually an issue there with, with potentially with David Gordon's um, own own um, audio. So I'll I'll pick it back up. I think he was just going to go to the first question, which actually follows on very nicely from um, the end of the Zido's um, uh, talk because she was talking about the general election in a couple of years. Um, but we've got a question from John Barr who asks. Does a new UK PM and presumably cabinet coming in in the autumn offer any opportunities for a change in direction towards the levelling up of those with disabilities? So I, he hasn't specified who that's for, but I think perhaps if we go to Fazilo first, because her talk touched on that at the end, and then see if Pauline wants to comment on that as well. Um, I'm not very optimistic on, on that one. Um, actually, I didn't get a chance to say that government's disability strategy, which they launched in July um, last year, um, 2021, um, disabled people took the government to court because um, there wasn't proper consultation with disabled people. And the court actually found that the online survey that the government did didn't constitute consultation. And um, because of that, um, they, they actually found the strategy to be unlawful. Now, it's, it's, a, it's a strange one because the government didn't need to do any consultation by law with us as disabled people, but because they called their online survey consultation, the court said, well, it was obviously not consultation, it was an online survey, and you didn't give people a chance to really feed into a strategy. And instead of the government actually coming back to disabled people and saying, let's do this differently. They're actually seeking permission to appeal the High Court ruling, which, which will just actually um, suspend action on disability for the foreseeable future. Um, so I don't think it, this will be affected by whoever takes on the leadership of the Conservative Party. And I don't have any particular hopes. I mean, we will use every opportunity. So if they, when there is a new leader, we will write to them. We will, we will push the envelope as much as we can. But um, I think one of the things we're going to do more urgently maybe is, is really talk to the Minister for Disabled People about whether a legal um, appeal is the right course of action or whether it would be better to sit down with disabled people and reinvigorate, renew uh, a disability strategy. So like for Zile, I'm not filled with optimism, I'm afraid. From my point of view, where we see good practice, it's based on individuals. It's not based on the systemic um, change that we need or the, the systemic you know the, the kind of group attitude really and I think there's so much that's fundamental that needs changing just pinning our hopes on one new prime minister I don't think it's going to cut the mustard I'm afraid brilliant thank you both very much for, for that um, so we've got uh, another question in from Rebecca Yeo who asks uh, so it's a bit of a, a lengthy one. Um, could you please give your thoughts on what we can do to improve the ongoing spread of COVID infection 
She's aware that there are increasing numbers of events at the university and beyond that are in person and only when there's and there's only little consideration of issues such as ventilation, ventilation or the need for masks. The result is therefore that anyone concerned about COVID infection is increasingly excluded. So she'd be interested in any ideas as to what we can do to promote better precautions and hybrid methods for public meetings. Um, I'm probably not an expert. I know that um, I was at a, a, a meeting yesterday um, where the, the rate of COVID has exponentially jumped over the last few weeks. And it is a real concern. And I know that um, certainly the NHS is reintroducing um, face coverings into its um, premises and services. And of course, they're, they're continuing to use PPE. So um, I suppose it's something for every service provider and every runner of um, big events to consider. But it does seem like the general, um, the general sort of view at the moment is let's all just carry on as normal. And um, that is very, of course, excluding for people who are um, clinically vulnerable and for whom COVID could be much more serious. I agree. I mean, at the moment, the responsibility appears to be on the person who, who wants to protect themselves from COVID rather than the responsibility of those putting on events to protect all potential attendees. And I think that's um, that, that you know that's clearly not right. Um, I just want to touch on the issue about long COVID as well here, because although it's slightly different, it is vaguely related. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure. I mean, for Zila, you might know about disabled people in general, but certainly for people with intellectual disabilities, we see no people with intellectual disabilities diagnosed, or very few diagnosed with long COVID. They don't appear in any long COVID clinics. And there's some concern about whether um, the longer term impact of COVID is actually being recognised in um, certainly people with intellectual disabilities in, in this case. We know very little about long term sequelae of the disease. We don't know how it's impacting on them. Um, and certainly, whereas I think most people in the general public would go to their GP for a sick note when they seem to have long, long term consequences of, of COVID. That's not the case with people with intellectual disabilities, by and large, who are not working. So they're they're being missed from uh, any sort of understanding about what the long-term consequences of COVID are. And that's a huge concern. I think. Yeah, that's really, I'd not thought of that, but um, I'm not aware of any um, information that shows a breakdown of that, the almost 2 million people with long COVID to understand, you know, whether they have disabilities or impairments or health conditions already, or um, I think mainly, um, We've thought about them in terms of employment rights, and um, they're, they're, of course, they're covered by the Equality Act if the impact is um, adverse and long term. So, um, yeah, I think that's an area that needs more probing, Pauline, definitely. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to actually come in on Rebecca's um, question myself as someone who does organise events and activities for for the university. Um, so we're still doing the majority of our activities online and, and the kind of COVID risk is the main driving force and well, the COVID risk itself, but also people's perception and maybe not wanting to take that, that risk. And we don't want to exclude those people as, as has been mentioned. Um, we have, we've had one in-person events since um, March, 2020, um, a few weeks ago, but we, we kept numbers low for that. Um, and we, we had a, a much larger room than we needed for, for the event itself. But we also, when we do in-person events, we always have a question if anyone's got any accessibility or other requirements. So we would encourage, and perhaps this is a lesson for us to rephrase it in this way, that if people have COVID concerns, they can, they can let us know. And then for example, if someone is clinically extremely vulnerable, we can maybe send, then send out an email to all other attendees and just say, if you, if you could wear a mask, we'd appreciate it. Um, or we could perhaps do something with a kind of table and, you know the seating allocations yeah. and things like that but we would very much welcome whenever we're running an in-person event um, if anyone would like to attend but is is nervous about any element of it to get in touch and 
um, either we'll come up with the solutions we can think of, but we would also really welcome and encourage people telling us what would help make our event more accessible for them, um, whether it's COVID or, or anything else, quite frankly. Um, but we, we are always willing to, to listen and, and try and, and be better in, in what we do. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it is really, really important and something we, we should be mindful of. But we are, we are trying to stick to online for, for the meantime, for the majority of our activities to, to help with that um, inclusivity. Um, so I think we've got one more question, then we'll probably have to, to wrap up looking at the time. Um, so this one is from John Barr again, who asks, does the government send so uh, special educational needs disability, I believe, um, sorry, probably, I'm a bit rubbish with acronyms sometimes, um, does the send review, um, is it the right support in the right place at the right time with the consultation that closes on the 22nd of July, does that offer any positive signs, do you think, um, that the government's moving in the right direction? Um, pers my personal view is, and we are we are going to put in a, a, a considered response to this. Uh, but my personal view is um, no. It it's it's about um, changing um, uh, some systems and some processes. It's about creating some um, more groups to discuss things. Um, it's, it's not linked to more funding going into um, special education needs and disability support. Um, it's not about making schools more inclusive. In fact, the government have a, um, a program to build more and more special schools. One of the articles they didn't sign up to in the UN convention was the one on inclusive education. So we have real concerns that it, it's, um, it's not coming at this um, from a real sense that our education system needs to be for everyone. The presumption should always be that um, disabled children are educated in the mainstream. There, there might be exceptions to that, of course, but the presumption should be that way around. And schools need to change the way they, they include people and, and um, include their pupils. And special education needs um, additional learning support um, needs to be fu properly funded and I don't think the green paper really um, answers any of those questions I'm sure um, I think I've also seen that um, some of the changes it's making to the appeals process will actually make it harder for parents to challenge and the other thing I should say is that very few children um, there's a narrow group of children who get education health and care plans which is a document that parents can challenge if it's not being implemented you know there's thousands of children who need support um, who don't have those plans because their support needs are considered um, uh, uh, significant enough yet those children have no way of of holding schools to account for the lack of support and for our you know they have no route to demanding more support so no, I, I don't think, I don't think, I think for me it's tinkering rather than a radical change. Um, Pauline, did you want to respond as well or? No, I think Priscilla <laughs> said it and very eloquently. <laughs> so, uh, I, have, um, I have nothing to add, I'm afraid. Can I ask a, a final question if we've got time? Uh, did the government do any consultation at all before uh, removing disabled people's rights in the Coronavirus Act? And do you know, or how did they justify it? And do you know if there's going to be a submission to the COVID inquiry on this? Will it be covered? Oh, well, they didn't consult. Um, they did it because um, they knew social care would be under pressure. And, and so, of course, social care is under pressure because it was underfunded anyway. Um, and we have made representations to the COVID inquiry because as we all know, 60% um, of deaths um, from coronavirus were disabled people. And we want disabled people's voice to be heard at that inquiry. And we and others I'm sure will make sure um, when the public hearings start next year that, that these issues including the Coronavirus Act aren't, aren't forgotten and are, are reviewed. I, can I just add that we actually provided evidence to the SAGE committee um, 
about the um, premature deaths of people with learning disabilities and the high um, age standardized mortality rate of people with um, intellectual disabilities. And it was a bit of a demoralizing um, meeting, I must say. Um, we kind of felt that we really weren't being listened to um, and that actually it wasn't going to make much difference. Now, in actual fact, a few weeks later, the policy on vaccination was changed. So I would like to hope that it did have some effect, but you're never quite sure. Um, and, you know, as Fazilo has said earlier, all we can do is keep plugging away oh. at, at, at changing that the system really and it's the system that that's broken here it's those system systemic changes that we need not a little bit of tinkering around the edges and you know a couple of people doing good really. brilliant thank you um so yeah we're pretty much um out of time i'm afraid um but i just want to take this opportunity to once again thank our two fantastic speakers Pauline and fazile um thank our bsl interpreters claire and darren my colleague Joe for all the logistics support in the background and being that swan with the crazy feet, keeping everything going and, and looking smooth on, on the surface. Um, and of course, thank you all, all the attendees in the room and particularly those who ask questions um, for engaging with us today, for, for turning up and, and hopefully for taking taking forward some of the, the reflections and the messages from, from these talks and, and applying those um, and, and just sharing those with, with colleagues um, and uh, taking those forward in the future. So clearly COVID-19 is having wide-ranging, complex and devastating impacts on communities um, around the world and those in poverty already and those with existing uh, issues such as, as disabled persons are being disproportionately affected, exacerbating existing socio-economic and ethnic and social inequalities. Um, but hopefully by coming together and learning about different perspectives and approaches and challenges, we can all be better situated to both individually and collectively make a positive impact. So uh, please do keep in touch. We've got our contact details there on screen. So drop us an email or get in touch with Twitter or whatever suits you. Um, so hope you found the webinar interesting and informative. Um, please do let us know any feedback and uh, do get in touch. If you're interested in following up on anything we've discussed today or with partnering with the Bristol Poverty Institute and our research community at the University of Bristol on this or any other topic related to poverty. So thank you everyone and have a great afternoon.